Good morning, everyone. Uh, we've got uh, a, a number of attendees uh, today. We're still uh, they're still coming in, so please just give us a few more seconds, and we'll get underway. Right, I think that'll do us. Uh, I think we've got uh, a lot of people in already, but there's probably more to come. So good morning, everyone. My name's Phil Anderson. I'm the General Manager of Policy and Professionalism at the AFA. Uh, this is another regulatory update from uh, what has been a most challenging and intense year. So really appreciate you joining me for this, which is going to be our last regulatory update for the year. Now, I'll just do a quick uh, housekeeping. Uh, we've gonna have uh, one hour of CPD available for the session today, uh, and that will be sent to you afterwards. All uh, webinar attendees are on mute during the, the webinar, but you will have the chance to ask questions. And we've, uh, we're fortunate to have Kaz Garad look after those questions. So we'll break in the middle and, and, and go through the questions that we have at that point, and then we'll come back at the end for more questions. So really look forward to your questions during the course of today. But please use the Q&A option down the bottom, not the chat option to get uh, your questions in. Right, so today, today is all about uh, the regulatory change that has impacted us during the course of the year. We're going to touch on some of the major things that are most relevant, so the single disciplinary body, the consultation on changes to standard three of the code of ethics, design and distribution obligations, changes to the internal dispute um, resolution regime, breach reporting, We'll look at what's yet to be finalised. And then at the end, we're going to focus on the opportunities we have next year to remove some of the bureaucracy and red tape that we have in the advice process through the re reviews that the government has committed to. So let's have a look at 2021, um, a year that I've described as a hyper-regulatory reform it's hard to believe, you know, we go back and we look at the start of the year. 1 January uh, 2021 was the deadline for the removal of grandfathered commissions. Um, obviously, some of them had disappeared sooner than the end of 2020, but that was the legislated date. The 5th of April uh, was the start of unfair contract terms for life insurance, which was an important reform in the scheme of things. The 1st of July uh, was when things started to heat up, and that was the start of the annual renewal regime. Uh, and, and obviously, we've got a 12-month transition period for that, so I'm sure that everyone's still in the middle of that, some having issued FDSs and maybe some holding off uh, until next year to issue their FDSs during that renewal, uh, sorry, that transition year. Disclosure of lack of independence also started on that day, as did the ban on ongoing advice fees from my super. And for those who did have those arrangements in place um, before this, this started, uh, you've got to 1 July 2022 to turn off ongoing advice fees from my super accounts. Now, then we look at October. Um, what I've described is the Red October Blitz of regulatory reform. The 1st of October started with the new breach reporting regime, mandatory reference checking, and um, for, for risk advisors, um, one of the most significant changes we've had in many years was that second phase of the APRA IDII intervention, where the products changed substantially. And I'm sure many of you are still coming to terms with that in understanding what the new products offer uh, and what the implications are for advice going forward, but also for existing clients. Then we had a few days off until the 5th of October when the design and distribution obligations regime commenced. 
and also the new internal dispute resolution regime. So they both started on the 5th of October. Now, here we are uh, at the end of November. Um, we've got pretty much one month to go before uh, the deadline for the first phase of uh, the FASEA exam. And I'll talk more about the, the changes to the exam and the extension as we go through the presentation this morning. The 1st of January 22 also represents the start of the single disciplinary body. And uh, it is the same time frame for FASEA to cease and regulatory oversight of financial advisors by the Tax Practitioners Board to come to an end. So that's what's happened this year. Um, in addition to that, and as we look forward to next year, we also have the compensation scheme of last resort, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. We've got the FASEA exam deadline phase two, which is the 30th of September next year. I'll talk more about that. And then also on the 1st of October, 2022, we've got the next phase of the APRA IDII intervention, which is when policies will be required to have written into their terms a five-year policy refresh so that the terms align with the terms of open products at that time. So a huge year. Um, so let's get through now into have a, um, looking at some of the other things that have changed during the course of 2021. We go back to January and ASIC um, had a, the C, CP332, which was the unmet advice needs project where they were seeking feedback from right across the sector on ideas about how they could improve their oversight and, and their guidance for, for the industry, how we could make financial advice more efficient and, and, and better for consumers. So it's an important process. We've seen a few things come out as a result of it, including the recent record of advice guidance. And I think we have to um, welcome that because records of advice is, is an area where licensees have tended to dictate how they were able to be used. So it's really good to get ASIC guidance on that. And, and we will get more from ASIC as we move forward in terms of these initiatives that will help improve the, the ability to give advice and the understanding of what your regulatory obligations are. We also saw on the 1st of June, a new chair for ASIC. And on day two uh, in his new job, he presented at a parliamentary hearing. And it was really refreshing to hear him say that he was worried about advice. He was worried about the cost of providing financial advice and also acknowledged the importance of financial advice. And we then had the opportunity at our conference in September to actually have the ASIC chair come along and talk to AFA members. And it was really great to have, it, have the chair of ASIC engage in the advice context, which we haven't seen before, and say such positive things about the role of financial advice. The AFA also had the opportunity to present to uh, a couple of parliamentary hearings during June and July, and one of those gave us the opportunity to talk about our vision for the future and to talk about where we're currently at. Um, and in, in the course of that hearing, we got to hear more from, a, from politicians who were prepared to go into bat for financial advice. And we've seen uh, a lot during the course of this year of politicians speaking up about the state of the advice market and about the need to make sure that financial advice remains accessible for everyday Australians. Now, some of the people who have been most vocal in these parliamentary hearings, um, we've seen recently um, promoted within the government. So people um, like Slade Brockman, who's been promoted to the, um, the president of the Senate, and most recently, Andrew Wallace, who was the chair of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services, who was promoted into the role of Speaker um, of the House of Representatives. We also saw the announcement about the extension of the exam deadline, which is just for those people who have had at least two attempts by the end of this year. 
Um, that was a, a key announcement and I'll talk more about that in a moment. We had further um, announcement from ASIC in terms of COVID relief uh, that covers records of advice and time critical advice. And it's just another sign I think of, of, of ASIC listening to the advice profession and being more engaged and more willing to uh, look at how they can help out to make things easier for advisors. And then what was probably uh, the biggest win of, uh, of during the course of 2021 was ultimately, and this was assisted by parliamentary hearings, putting a lot of focus on how it was possible that the ASIC funding levy could have more than tripled in, uh, in the course of three years, that the, the government in late August finally agreed to provide some relief. And that has meant that it has been pegged at $1,142 per advisor for last financial year and this current financial year. Uh, and, and that has turned out at a saving of probably around $2,400 per advisor in each of those years. So a, a really big win for, for advocacy. So yes, there's been a lot happening during the course of 2021. Now I wanna um, primary focus today is on the single disciplinary body. And we're gonna talk about the single disciplinary body and the, and the bill that it came from, which was the Better Advice Bill, which was finally passed in the Senate on the 21st of October. Now there were four key parts of this bill. So the first part is the establishment of the single disciplinary body. And yes, we talk about the single disciplinary body, but you'll also hear conversation about the financial services and credit panel. That is the key part of the single disciplinary body that will be um, oversighting the, um, uh, any matters brought to their attention. And, and that means that uh, that's a body that includes um, two people who are from industry in addition to one person from from ASIC, so it's putting in place a peer review model. The Better Advice Bill also uh, resulted in the winding up of FASEA, uh, and it provided the legislative mechanism to do that. It also built into it the ability for the government to set a regulation to provide a further extension to the exam, um, but they made it clear at that time that that would only be available for those people who had had at least two attempts at the exam by the end of this year. And the fourth part of the Better Advice Bill was the effective removal of financial advisors from the TPB TASA regime. And why I'm saying effective is because there are some financial advisors, those who work only with wholesale clients and are not on the financial advisor register, who are still in the TPB regime, plus there are some elements of the TPB regime that have been rolled into the um, Corporations Act regime or the AFSL regime, and I'll talk more about that in a moment as well. So yeah, four key parts to this, um, this reform, uh, and we're going to go through some of these in a little bit more detail now. Uh, yeah, I, I think the point is a really big reform with broad consequences. Now, the, the Better Advice Bill provided, a, uh, provided the mechanism for a lot of the detail to be set out in regulations. The legislation gets passed in the parliament, it's debated in the parliament, ultimately has to be voted on. Regulations are a level down where the, the minister can set regulations. They don't need to be debated in the parliament. They can be disallowed in the parliament, but it means that it's easier for the government to tweak them. So they've taken the approach of the legislation defines the higher level stuff, the regulation provides some of the specifics. So the regulations that have been released for consultation and we're yet to get the final one, which uh, is, you know, we, we've got to be conscious that it all starts in a month's time. So this is what we're dealing with at the moment. I had hoped that we would have the final regulations before this webinar, but it may, may be still a, a couple of weeks away. So there are four key parts of the regulations that I want to talk about. Now, 
the regulations uh, are defining which disciplinary matters must be referred to a financial services and credit panel. We'll go through each of these in a moment. It addresses which disciplinary sanctions must be recorded on the financial advisor register. And of course, the financial advisor register is a public register. So this is really important to understand what could be on your public record in terms of any sanctions that are issued. It also provides the detail around the extension for the exam through to the 1st of October next year, but it is importantly limited to those people who have attempted the exam at least twice by the end of this year. And then it also defines the education and training requirements for, and this is a new term, qualified tax relevant providers. So this is about providing tax advice through the Corporations Act or AFSL regime, rather than through the TPB regime. And we're gonna go through that in detail. Now, there is another part to the, to the Better Advice Bill regulations that I just wanted to highlight. And that is that they are going to exempt breaches of, of the Code of Ethics and the CPD obligations. And I need to point out that there's CPD obligations that apply broadly, as we know with the FASEA standard, but there will be a new CPD standard <clears throat> that applies to qualified tax relevant providers as well. Now, um, in saying that that's no longer uh, required to be reported to ASIC under the breach reporting regime, although you need to be conscious that any failure to meet your CPD requirements is already separately reported to ASIC and it is recorded on the financial advisor register. So you will see, if you go looking at yourself on the financial advisor register, there is a section there that includes details on any failure to comply with the CPD requirements. So it will still need to be recorded through that vehicle but it will not be treated as a reportable breach through the ASIC reportable breach process. So let's now have a look at the issue of which disciplinary matters must be referred to a financial services and credit panel. Now I wanna make it really clear and it's the footnote on this page, this only stipulates which ones must be referred. ASIC um, has the ability to refer um, other matters that they wish to the financial services and credit panel. So just keep in mind, it doesn't necessarily mean that other matters will not be referred. Now, when we talk about the financial services and credit panel, this is um, a, a group of at least three people who will be empowered to consider particular disciplinary matters. And as I said, two of them are expected to be industry um, representatives. <clears throat> so the circumstances include where an advisor becomes an insolvent under administration. And in the past, um, advisors in certain circumstances might have ended up being um, made bankrupt for a range of reasons and not necessarily related to their advice business. So we have seen in a small number of cases, advisors may, being made bankrupt in the past. What this means <clears throat> is that if you are made bankrupt after the 1st of January, 2022, then that will be a matter that needs to be considered by the financial services and credit panel. If you're convicted of fraud, and, and, and I'm sure we can all say, well, rightly so, there are certain obligations uh, in the law that if you breach will also mandatorily be referred to a, a panel. <clears throat> and they include not complying with the education and exam standards, which I think in practice means if you continue to operate after you have failed to meet the exam deadline and the education deadline, certain PY requirements and supervisors not providing approval of a professional year students SOAs before they're provided to, to clients and also providing personal advice when you're unregistered. And I'll, I will talk in a moment about <clears throat> changes to the registration regime. Also, if ASIC reasonably believes that a, that a financial advisor is not a fit and proper person, and the Corporations Act now has a set of um, 
factors that would be taken into account to assess whether you are a fit and proper person. Where a financial advisor has contravened a financial services law and the contravention is serious. And in a moment, I'll talk about the definition of serious. And there's another interesting one where an advisor has been involved in the contravention of a financial services law by another person and the contravention is serious. Um, and there is one um, final uh, criteria that may lead to a matter being referred to the FSCP. And this is where an advisor has at least twice been linked to a refusal or failure to pay a determination uh, issued by AFCA. And, and they've provided a little bit more context around this. They've said that it needs to involve either material loss or damage to a client of the advisor or that the advisor has obtained a material benefit as a result, or it involves dishonesty or fraud. <clears throat> so I, I think um, this probably comes back to the issue of the compensation scheme of last resort as well, but you just need to be conscious that to the extent that you're involved in the failure to pay a determination, which is typically uh, related to the licensee going uh, into insolvency, there are other consequences. Now, let's just come back and reflect upon this concept of serious. So it's a contravention of the law that is considered serious. So the, the regulations talk about this in terms of it's resulted or it's likely to result in a material loss or damage to a client. I don't think any of us could disagree that where there's a breach of the law and there's a material loss to the client, that that is something that um, could reasonably be considered by a panel. Second, has resulted or is likely to result in a material benefit to the financial advisor. And in our feedback to the to Treasury on this, we said, well, what does material benefit mean? And in any case, uh, an advisor is rightly um, going to be remediate, uh, remunerated for providing financial advice to clients and it's a valuable service. So it should be a material benefit. So we'll wait till the details on this come out, but um, that's another factor. And also where it involves dishonesty or fraud, which um, I don't think any of us would disagree. Now, I just wanna make the point that the single disciplinary body regime and the application of any sanctions only applies to breaches that occur from next year. It is not a retrospective regime, it is a prospective only regime. Right, so let's now look at the issue of sanction. At the moment, ASIC has very limited um, sanctions powers. Really the only thing that they can do is ban an advisor or alternatively um, agree to put an enforceable undertaking in place with an advisor. Now, the banning power is not something that's defined in these um, regulations and, and neither is the fact that a banning will be recorded on the financial advisor register there's also a, a register of banned and disqualified people. So ASIC will still have that power to ban advisors. And, and as we know, it will be recorded on the FAR. If we talk about um, the financial services and credit panel, they have a range of new disciplinary sanctions that they can take against an advisor. It includes prohibition, which is basically that you're removed or you're banned from providing advice for a certain period of time, a suspension. So they might decide to suspend someone for three months or six months. And then they can take other actions such as require specified training, require that an advisor receives counseling or they're subject to specified supervision or that there are certain matters that need to be reported to ASIC. So um, what I wanna do is come back to which things are actually gonna be re recorded on the FAR. Prohibition, definitely. Suspension, definitely. Those other four that where you're um, required to do certain things, 
they won't be recorded on the FAR if it's your first um, uh, offence. If it's a, a second offence, if, for example, you've previously been um, given a requirement to have specific counselling and you uh, go back to an FSCP and they say, well, you need specified training, then that second matter will be recorded on the, on the FAR. And finally, uh, an FSCP could issue a written warning or reprimand, and the regulations make it clear that a written warning or reprimand from either the FSCP or from ASIC will not be recorded on the FAR. Now, ASIC also has the power now to issue a written warning or reprimand for matters that they choose not to refer to an FSCP. So put quite precisely, should ASIC decide that they're aware of a matter that involves a breach of the law and they choose not to refer it to an FSCP, then they are required to investigate it and they're required to issue a warning or reprimand. So it is um, part of the regime that matters might be considered by either ASIC or the FSCP. And you've got to think of S F the FSCP as a part of ASIC, but subject to a range of different rules, such as the establishment of these panels to review matters and to make decisions with respect to sanctions. All right, let's move on to the exam extension. So the Better Advice Bill provided the legislative mechanism to enable an extension. It was the regulations that will actually achieve uh, that extension. And what they have put in the draft regulations is consistent with what the minister said in her media release on the 24th of June. So the extension will be until the 30th of September next year, but only for existing advisors, and, and that's a defined term, who have attempted the exam at least twice by the end of this year. Now, we've already had the last exam of the year, so people will already know whether they have attempted it twice or not. The last exam was a couple of weeks ago, 11th to the 16th of November. Now, it typically takes them six weeks to issue the results from the exam. We know that this was a really big sitting. We, we understand it was at least two and a half thousand uh, advisors who sat this exam. They're going to have to wait until pretty much Christmas to get the results. We know that that's going to be a really um, critical time. And you know, it may be that some have attempted it for the first time and they're, they're hoping that they'll pass. Um, if, if they have attempted it for the first time this time, then uh, obviously the consequences are if they pass, great. But if they don't pass, then they won't qualify for the extension into next year. Now, I just want to, at this point, highlight the fact that, yes, you might have the two attempts and you might therefore have the extension into next year. Advisors do have an alternative. And that alternative is to come off the financial advisor register before the end of this year and then sit the exam at some stage next year, but they would not be able to operate. They would not be able to practice until they'd pass the exam and then come back on the register. So just keep in mind that you do still have the choice of going off the register, but you would then not be able to practice until you'd pass the exam. Now, um, it's important to note that ASIC is going to be administering the exam next year. So FASEA comes to an end at the end of December, and then ASIC takes over from January next year. At a um, parliamentary hearing last week, ASIC made statements to the effect that they intend to have three exams next year before the end of September, and plus another one in the fourth quarter of next year. They are still in the process of negotiating with the vendor, and we will not 
um, have the exact timetable for those exams next year for a little while yet. The other important thing to note is that the cost of the exam next year is increasing. So this year it's 540 plus GST, so 596. From next year, from the start of next year, it will be $948 per sitting. Now we're gonna have less people sitting, um, so the scale of economy uh, won't be there next year. Now this is a, um, a regulated number that the government has set through the regulations. The other fee that is set out in these regulations is a new advisor registration fee. Now, licensees will need to, during the course of next year, register all of their financial advisors with ASIC, and that will involve a fee of $95. Um, so at, licensees will register advisors, and there'll be a set of declarations that need to be made around fit, fit and proper um, next year. There'll be another stage a few years down the track where it will become necessary for advisors to individually register with ASIC on an annual basis. Right, so the last part of the single discipline body, or at least the, the better advice bill changes, is the TPB implications. Now, the the Better Advice Bill will result in the end of oversight of financial advisors. And in this sense, I'm talking specifically about those who are registered on the financial advisor. So an end of oversight by the TPB. However, the legislation provided um, the um, power for the minister to define education and training requirements for these people who are going to become qualified tax relevant providers. Now, our view has always been that all advisors are going to refer to tax in some way in the advice that they provide, whether that's talking about capital gains tax or it's talking about the tax deductibility of um, income protection insurance premiums. So we think that everyone will ultimately need to be um, in this qualified tax relevant providers category. So what the, the better advice regulations have said is that the CPD target for financial advisors will stay at 40 hours, but there will be a new category called technical tax specific, and you'll need to do five hours for that. So what that means is that it won't change the total. You'll have more defined hours that you need to do, which means you'll have less general hours available to you. Now, the, the draft regulations suggest that this new five hour category will commence from the first CPD year that starts from the 1st of January next year. So if, you're, if you operate on a calendar year basis, it'll start from the 1st of January. If your CPD year is the financial year, then it will start from the 1st of July, 2022. Now, I'll just, I'll just give you a note of caution there that I think that um, there's been some pushback that that's going to start too quickly and licensees won't have the time to prepare. So we'll, we'll wait and see what the outcome is there. Now, I said there's this new classification of qualified tax relevant providers and the basic expectation in the legislation, in the, in the regulation is that qualified tax relevant providers which is all advisors, as I've said, will need to have completed two subjects. So there's a commercial law and a taxation law subject. These are the same subjects that have historically been required by the TPB. They're at AQF5 level, so they're not anywhere near as, as high as the FASEA standards, which is degree or AQF7. However, there are specific exemptions. And these exemptions include any existing financial advisor who's on the FAR, who is registered with the TPB immediately before 1 January 2022. Now, for those people which makes up um, a large chunk of advisors who are already registered with the TPB, they will not need to do those two subjects. They will have a permanent exemption. There's another category, which is 
those who have applied to register with the TPB prior to 1 January 2022, but are still awaiting the outcome of that registration process. For all other um, registered financial advisors, you will have to do those two subjects, but you'll have four years to do it. So you'll have until the end of 2025. Now I've talked about the fact that there are other people who might be caught out by this regime change, and that includes advisors who provide advice only to wholesale clients. They do not need to be registered on the FAR, and therefore they're not covered by this mechanism of um, qualified tax relevant providers. They will have the opportunity to become conditional tax agents, as will licensees that provide robo advice, where the advice is not provided by an individual. So let's have a look at this. What, what does this mean and what decisions do advisors need to take? And I wanna just take you back to the current TPB registration model. It, you've got a range of different options. You can have a degree, a diploma um, or, or three years experience or item 304 of the, um, the, the TPB registration regime for tax financial advisors is that you're a member of a recognized tax financial advisor association and you have six out of the last eight years full-time experience. That was the option where you didn't need to do that um, commercial law and tax law subjects. So they are the group that will get the exemption, but they must remain registered with the TPB right until the end of this year. Now, if you don't stay registered until the end of this year, then when the TPB and ASIC work on the transfer of details of who are registered, you won't get recorded. So it's important that you remain registered with the TPB through to the end of this year. Now, we're also conscious that not all financial advisors have been registered with the TPB, and some licensees chose to use the mechanism that was available through the TASA regime of sufficient number model. And that meant that you could um, choose to register with, uh, well, you, you didn't have to be registered with the TPB. And there are people who might, as a result of that, make, um, make the decision that it's, it's a good idea to register with the TPB before the end of this year. But it would only make sense if you're a member of a recognised tax financial advisor association and you have six out of the last eight years full-time experience. The only complication is whilst you're waiting for confirmation of your registration, you couldn't provide tax financial advice services. Now, in conversations with the TPB, they're saying that they are turning these registrations around in 30 days. So it wouldn't go for that long, but it is um, something to consider. Now for others um, who don't qualify for the six out of the last eight years experience and are not members of a recognised tax financial advisor association, you have little choice other than to do those two courses before the end of December 2025. Now make another really important point. I know it's a bugbear for advisors that they have to register themselves and they also have to register their car with the TPB. And in some cases where they're self-licensed, they need to register their license and themselves as individuals. The need to register cars will come to an end um, at the end of this year. So key message, um, please don't give up your TPB registration before the end of the year. If your renewal comes before the end of this year, it is unfortunate that you're going to have to pay, but it makes sense because if you don't re renew, then you won't be treated as exempt from those two courses going forward. Now, we might just pause there. Um, Kaz, are there any questions that, that you'd like to put forward at this point? Um, yes, there, there are a couple of questions that have come through, Phil. Um, one of the questions was about um, the exam. And just to asking for clarification, where an advisor does not pass the exam um, and if they're removed from the FAR by 1 January 2022, then what would they have to go through to then be reappointed 
to get back on the farm. Okay, so so the, the important thing is you've got to be cleanly off the far before the end of this year. There is mechanism. They talk about it as people on career break. And people on career break are able to come back and they are able to continue to be treated as an existing advisor, which means you don't have to do um, an undergraduate degree. You don't have to do the professional year, but you can't come back until you've passed the exam so you need to do the exam next year and then you need to be reauthorized. And that means that you can, from that point, continue on, although obviously you've still got to meet your education requirements by the end of 2025. Okay, so we have another exam question. Um, if someone has failed the exam twice, are they able to carry on their business as a licensed financial advisor and still see their clients until September of next year? Most definitely. This is a genuine ex extension. It means that you can continue to practice for those nine months. So absolutely, Th that's the benefit here is that it's not forcing you to leave um, it's not forcing you to put things on hold until you've passed. You can continue to operate. Okay. We, we have a question around the ethics um, module. Um, and the question is, is there a requirement to do the FASIA ethics course before December of 2025? So there's a requirement that uh, everyone has met the degree equivalent requirement. And, and whatever way you look at it, unless you have done that ethics unit more recently, like since it was made available from 2019, then everyone will need to do it. Even people who have done a degree that was previously considered as an approved degree, are required to do it. People who have done a, a relevant degree will be required to do that unit. Everyone beyond 2025 must have done that ethics unit. Good. Um, there's a question about the, um, the, the new category of tax specific, uh, the five hours. Is that five hours of technical tax specific replacing the TASA CPD hours? Yeah, so, so the, the TPB TASA um, CPD hours disappear. You've only got one CPD standard, which is the AFSL Corporations Act one. So 40 hours, yes, and built within that is that five hours that need to be spent on tax relevant uh, CPD. Very good. All right, well, Kaz, we might uh, push on and then we've got uh, time at the end for, for Q&A. So I will keep moving. Um, so Code of Ethics, it's been a, a bugbear of, of many of us for the last three years. Um, in February of 2019, when they issued this, um, you must not advise, refer or act in any other manner where you have a conflict of interest or duty. Um, we, we obviously uh, called that unworkable and, and have been asking for it to be changed. FASIA, um, now into you know, one month to go, are going through a process of consulting on changes. They've given us two options. We definitely favor option one, you must only advise, refer or act where you do not have a conflict of interest or duty, being that which could reasonably be expected to induce you to act other than in the client's best interest. Now we're um, providing feedback on that and we might suggest that there's um, some ways of, of making it clearer. Obviously, what we want is regulatory certainty so that you know exactly how you can operate but that regulatory certainty needs to ensure that there is no doubt that you can receive commissions for life insurance advice 
and that you can charge asset-based fee arrangements should that be what your clients choose to, to use. There is a second alternative, which is more focused on the benefits and the relationships um, that we don't favour. Now, i just make one final concluding point here. Keep in mind that ASIC issued a facility of compliance approach with respect to standards three and seven in November of 2019. But at that time, they said that this would apply until the single disciplinary body was operational. Now, given that the single disciplinary body will be operational from the 1st of January next year, that facility of compliance approach disappears. And we need to ensure that we are complying with standards three and seven. So that's why this consultation process is so important. And we look forward to FASIA announcing changes to standard three before the end of the year. So design and distribution obligations, another major change which started on the 5th of October. Now, in terms of an, an advisor and a licensee's obligations here, um, ASIC expects that advisors will refer to the target market determination as part of the process of complying with the best interest duty. So they expect you to be cognizant of what the target market determination says. Licensees are going to need to provide regular reporting to product issuers, and that's set out in the target market determinations. I've got a particular focus on complaints, and we need to keep in mind that these are um, product complaints. They also are potentially about the distribution process. Um, so it's not just advice complaints, and it means that we may need to be tracking product complaints that we haven't tracked in the past. So for example, when a client complains about their, their IP premiums going up by 50, 70%, that's a product complaint and you would need to track that. Now, um, one of the things that you, you also need to start doing is reporting significant dealings to the product issue. And I'm gonna talk a bit more about significant dealings in just a moment. Now, you are allowed as an advisor to recommend a product to a client which is out where they are outside the TMD. And this is because you've got other obligations under the best interest duty. Um, however, that may mean because you're recommending a product outside the, the clients, uh, where the client's outside the TMD, that you've got obligations to report it to the product issuer. And, and some are, are actually getting you to set that out in in application forms. So look, I guess if I did a poll, you know, how are people traveling with uh, DDO? They'd probably say they're not particularly clear on what they need to do and they're not particularly happy about all the extra work that they need to do. And there's a few things that, that have been flushed out so far, such as, um, if a client, you know, is a client outside the TMD um, where they select an investment option as part of a portfolio. Now, I want to just come back to that in a moment. Lack of clarity around what a significant dealing is. And I, I just want to um, make sure that people are conscious that significant dealings are not likely to be common. And, and that's in part because uh, there are very few circumstances, for example, with a superannuation product where you're likely to be... Um, outside of the TMD. E equally with insurance products, it's very unlikely that people are going to be outside of the TMD. Um, so significant dealings are not likely to be common. We, we've got questions and pushback about why product issuers are expecting advisors to report all dealings that are outside the TMD and not just significant dealings. And then of course, the whole reporting requirement is, is going to add administrative um, bureaucracy and workload and extra record keeping. The, the government fortunately did uh, actually intervene. The law originally said that licensees needed to provide nil reports um, when there's nothing that actually is reportable. And that would have just been a ridiculous exercise, um, particularly for small licensees that have broad APLs. So they could potentially need to be doing a significant number of nil reports. Now, I just want to come back to this issue 
of being outside the target market determination and also portfolios um, and diversification. So the, the FSC have provided guidance and they actually have set out templates. And in those templates, it talks to the criteria that you might um, need to trigger to be considered to be outside the TMD. And there are certain red rating items and there are amber rating items. So any red um, item is gonna trigger that and three or more of the amber ratings. So you'd need to um, either have the client in a product that uh, it certainly doesn't meet their investment time frame, or you know, they're, they're investing for 12 months and you put them in an equities fund, or they uh, are outside their risk profile in that they're, they're conservative and you've put them fully into um, growth assets. But I do want to just come back to this issue of of diversification and portfolios. So if a client's in a conservative um, uh, risk profile, they may still have 30% of their funds in growth assets. And so what, what is being said here is that a client can have, uh, who's a, a conservative client, can have 30% of their portfolio in growth assets. That does not mean recommending the growth assets for that 30% of, uh, of their overall portfolio is um, sufficient to push them outside of their target market determination. So it just means you do have flexibility. You don't have to be worried about, you know, a, a conservative client can't have any growth assets. They can. It just has to be assessed in terms of uh, that allocation of their portfolio and where you reserve 30%, for example, of their portfolio for growth assets, then you are um, absolutely entitled to recommend growth assets and it's not outside the target market determination. So we're trying to um, help with making that as clear as possible. Uh, and these, this is set out in the FSC template, as you can see here. Um, ASIC have provided guidance on DDO, so info sheet 264 is worth having a read. Internal dispute resolution. Now, I just want to summarise the key changes here. This came in from the 5th of October. Um, RG Regulatory Guide 271 now includes enforceable provisions. So um, this means that licensees will take IDR more seriously than they have in the past. The maximum time to finalise a complaint has been reduced from 45 days to 30 days. You also... Uh, have an obligation to include certain complaints on social media platforms. And importantly, whereas in the past, a matter that was resolved within the first five days did not need to be recorded on your register, it now does need to be. Complaints reporting to ASIC on, on internal dispute resolution is about to start, and they've actually uh, indicated that there's a pilot that's running over the course of the last part of this year. There are a range of other obligations in RG271 about enhanced governance and resourcing requirements. And so licensees um, will need to give consideration to that. Now, this is obviously predominantly the responsibility of licensees to make sure that they embed uh, their IDR regime to work in a way that complies with RG271. But it's important that advisors know that the timeframes have been reduced, the new reporting requirements, um, because your licensees will expect you to deal with these matters and report complaints to them. Just want to reflect upon the definition of a complaint, which is an expression of dissatisfaction made to or about an organisation related to its products, services, staff, or the handling of a complaint. Importantly, where a response or resolution is explicitly or implicitly expected or legally required. So it, that last part's important. So if it's just a chit chat and the client doesn't expect you to do anything about it, then it's not a complaint. But if they do frame it in terms of they expect you to do something about it, uh, then you get caught. And the last part of this is, is the bit about posts on social media. So if it's posted on a um, on a media channel or account owned or controlled by a financial firm that is subject uh, of the post then, and the author is both identifiable and contactable, 
then you need to record that as a complaint. Breach reporting, um, this, is, this has started um, uh, from, from October. That key points, it's complex. Um, you've got new obligations about reporting. Licensees need to report financial advisors from other licensees, and there are a range of additional um, remediation and client notification obligations. <coughs> so please have a look at RG78. In terms of what's reportable, as I said, it's been made more complicated, but it comes back to breaches of core obligations that are significant. Now, all financial services law, and this specifically, I guess, is focused on the Corporations Act and the ASIC Act are considered core obligations. And all breaches of civil, civil penalty provisions other than those that have been exempted by regulations, and I'll talk to that in a moment, are treated as significant. And even an investigation that has been underway for more than 30 days into a potential breach becomes a reportable matter. So if we talk about civil penalty um, provisions that have been exempted from being reported, things like failures to provide an FSG. Many of the fee disclosure statement and client consent obligations have also been exempted, other than the one about continuing to charge after you've been instructed to turn the fee off. Failure to provide um, a product disclosure statement. Uh, and as we talked about before, breaches of the code of ethics and the CPD obligations uh, have been exempted, um, as have civil penalty provisions of, of other acts. ASIC have also said that any breaches of the IDR requirements in RG271 are not automatically reportable. We expect the biggest driver of breaches will be breaches of the best interest duty. However, ASIC have confirmed that a failure to comply with each of the um, seven steps in the safe harbour does not necessarily mean it's a breach of the best interest duty if you can independently or separately confirm that it does comply with the best interest duty. So that's an important uh, overlay there. Um, reporting advisors from other licensees, yes, this is, uh, this is a new world that we're in. And uh, in the context of, uh, of licensees re reviewing client files before they recruit someone, uh, it's gonna make an interesting challenge. Uh, in terms of notifying and remediating impacted clients, um, there's new obligations there where there's been a reportable situation and there are reasonable grounds to expect that the client has suffered loss or damage, then you need to notify them. You've got third, the licensee's got 30 days to do that and they must be notified after the completion of the investigation and they must be remediated within 30 days. So there are new um, and particularly rigorous obligations that come into play. Now, I just want to talk about compensation scheme of last resort. I'm very conscious I'm just about out of time. Um, this legislation is in the parliament, um, hasn't been passed yet and probably won't be debated this year. The scope of the scheme is very narrow and it particularly focuses on financial advisors, credit providers, mortgage brokers and securities dealers. Now, there is some suggestions that have been made by uh, other parties that Hain thought that it should be focused on the banks and managed investment schemes. Hain never said that. He only supported the Ramsey inquiry, which was very focused on financial advice. And that's because the history of unpaid determinations from AFCA and the um, previous schemes has actually been predominantly in the advice space. That means that advice will inevitably pick up a large slice of the cost, um, but the, uh, the draft legislation or the legislation in the parliament says the government will pick up the cost for the first 12 months and any outstanding determinations as at the commencement of the, of the scheme will be paid by the 10 largest banks and life insurers. Um, and look, the, the, the recent debate and, and the discussion uh, has been around whether managed investment schemes should be part of the scope of this. We have said yes, that they should be part of this. And it's not that we're saying bank owned managed investment schemes should be covered. It's all managed investment schemes should be covered because managed investment schemes have seen product failures, um, which has left people uh, unremediated. And Sterling First in WA is a classic example 
as are many of the collapses that occurred as a result of the GFC. Now, um, quickly, next year is a year of, of major reviews. There's the quality of advice review that incorporates the, the LIF review. There's also a review around the ASIC funding levy so that we can get a better model there and a professional indemnity insurance review uh, over the course of next year. And the last um, point to make is next year, there's a big unknown. There's a federal election, which will probably be either March or May. Um, we, we don't know what might happen, but we could end up with a new government. So um, I haven't left much time for questions. I've left no time for questions, but um, Mel and Kaz, I, I'm happy that, that we, um, we keep it open to, to go through any questions. People can, um, can leave uh, uh, at any time they choose, but if they want to stay for a few more minutes for, um, uh, for, for questions, then that's open to them. I'm just conscious that they won't miss out on their CPD if they choose to leave now. So Kaz, uh, any um, key questions that you'd like to cover? Uh, there was a question about um, what happens um, when FASIA no longer exists um, at, by the 1st of January and um, what would happen to all the principles that are already in existence? Um, in okay, so the, all of the standards that FASIA have set will survive the government is actually in the process of reissuing the exam standard, which seeming, seemingly is the only one that they need to refresh, but all of the other ones will stay. The minister is now responsible for those standards. So we haven't given up hope, for example, that the education standard may better incorporate recognition of prior learning and experience. So they, um, they stay in place until the minister chooses to change them. Okay, um, so the, there are a couple of questions around the target market um, determination. I'm, I'm thinking we could perhaps compile a, a Q and A um, list to go on the webinar on the website along with the the webinar. Um, that could be a way of addressing some of the questions. Um, should we take just one more question, Phil? Um, yes. If an advisor were to report to an insurer on the target market um, determination, um, that say it was a large increase in premium, well, what would the process be? Um, does that life insurer have the obligation to report themselves to ASIC? No. So. This is about reporting complaints um, to the product issuer. And then the product issuer has, has a set of obligations then to consider whether the target market determination is appropriate, um, whether they should be targeting different clients. Um, so it doesn't make it um, mandatory that they report it to ASI, no. Um, internal dispute resolution. Um, so is it true that rhetorical or any throwaway comment um, that they're, they're no longer complaints or are they complaints? Well, it comes back to that definition of a complaint and it, mean, it needs to be an expression of dissatisfaction where there is an expectation that you will, they'll get a response or that there's a, a legal right to get a response. So if it's a throwaway comment, then that implies that they don't expect to get um, a, 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 a response or a resolution. So yeah, if you've got those sorts of situations, you probably need to say, look, um, you, you give an answer and you say, well, I trust you're fine with that. You don't need anything further. Mm. Or, or do you want a response from us on that? Do you have a best guess on the timing for the release of the LIF review? Yeah, so the LIF review is, has been incorporated as part of the quality of advice review. And, and I wouldn't be expecting to see the outcome of that until right towards the end of next year. Hmm. So it will become a, a, 
a smaller part of a bigger review, which will take the focus off it. Um, but I don't expect that we'll get to see that until the end of next year. So there's been a couple of comments about whether the TPB might be providing any refunds. Uh, I think we know what the answer to that might be. Uh, a very, very clear answer from uh, the TPB is it's a registration fee. It's, it's not for the duration, it's to go through the process of registering. So I'm, I'm sorry, we have, uh, we have in our advocacy um, highlighted it seems unfair for those people who have renewals due just before the end of this year. Um, but other than making that point very clearly, we can't offer anything more that, that there will be no refunds. Okay, I think we're probably out of time. What do you think? Okay, well, I'm happy to have a look at those outstanding questions and we can put something on the website then. So thanks, Kaz, for, for those questions. I might just wrap it up there. Um, you'll be able to access the, the webinar um, and you will get um, uh, presentation slides will also be on the website and people will be able to do a, a CPD assessment quiz. Uh, all, all registrants will receive emails confirming when it's available. If you do have any questions, please get in touch with the AFA. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for your support during the course of this year, which has been an incredibly challenging regulatory reform year. Um, we look forward to continuing to update you on uh, key developments in the, in the new year. So have a great break, um, enjoy some downtime, um, make sure you can get recharged ready for another big year next year. Thank you very much, everyone.